accomplished together as we've done a series of sermons. But today we come to the last commandment, the tenth word that God spoke to His people. Beginning next week, we will begin looking at, uh, looking forward to uh, Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate uh, the season uh, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will be looking at some of the final uh, works that Jesus did and uh, things that He said as it leads to the time of His crucifixion and then His resurrection. Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You shall not covet. Have you ever asked yourself, what does my heart desire? What is the greatest desire of my heart? What is that one thing that I want more than anything else? Maybe there's more than one thing. Maybe there are two or three things that your heart desires. But we need to ask ourselves, what does our heart desire? Because there's a second question. What does my heart desire? Where will my heart's desire lead me in order to fulfill that desire? Where will my desire take me? What will my desire cause me to do? Then there's a third question we need to ask. Not only do we need to ask ourselves, what is my heart's desire? And where will my heart's desire take me? But the third question is, who will I be when I have fulfilled my heart's desire? You see, the idea of coveting is a heart's desire. This word can be read... You shall not desire in your heart your neighbor's house. You shall not desire in your heart your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Coveting is a heart's desire. It is a heart's desire that motivates. You see... What my heart desires will be the focus of my everyday thought. It will continually come up in my mind. If it is indeed my heart's desire, it will be before me like a carrot before the donkey. Leading us forward until we find the way to reach it. Not only is it our everyday thought, but it becomes our immediate, our intermediate, or maybe even our infinite goal, what we will accomplish. It becomes our motivation to do what we do, to be who we are. This very word from God, Do not covet. Literally confronts us with the desire of our heart, and if that desire of our heart is sin, it shows even to the moral man his need for a Savior. What does my heart desire? The previous commandments that God has given, especially those that have to do with loving our neighbor, are a list of do nots. Don't do this. But this command warns us don't selfishly desire. It is not an act, it is the intent of the heart.
guard the intent of your heart is this word from God. Why? Because the intent of our heart is usually what we do and who we become. That which motivates us. To covet is the excessive need to have something that someone else has. Coveting is an ungoverning, selfish desire to have what your neighbor has, what your friend has, what your companion has, what your family has, what the stranger down the street has, keeping up with the Joneses has. That excessive need. And God says that we need to see where our desire is pointing us because too often the desire that we have in our heart can threaten the basic rights of others. Don't covet that which is your neighbor's. Why? Because if you do, you may find a way to get it for yourself, thus harming your neighbor and others about him. You see, unholy desires quickly turn to deadly desires. James said in James chapter one, verses fourteen and fifteen, but each one of is but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, the desires of his heart that are opposed to God. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. It's not just wanting what we do not have, but it is wanting what another has that will eventually bring a consuming desire in our heart and our mind which causes us to be empty of nothing except that consuming desire. The Scripture is clear. The covetous person will break all of God's commandments in order to satisfy their desires. Because at the heart of sin is sin in the heart. Jesus said, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. Consider how this works. The Apostle Paul concludes his letter to young Timothy by saying, but those who want to get rich, there's their heart desire, there's what they covet, to get rich. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. That's the don't do's. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and perceived, or pierced themselves with many griefs. But don't do this. You see, the desire of the heart determines what we do. And if it is a don't do, obviously it becomes sin. Destructive to our life, but not only destructive to our life, but destructive to the lives of others. This morning I want to refer back to four illustrations that we have used over the last few weeks. I want us to look at these illustrations and to look not just at what they did or the laws that they broke or the commandments that they broke, but I want us to see the desire and the intent of the heart that motivated them to the act. As we do this, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21, we, we have this commandment regarding coveting quoted again by Moses in a sermon. And in this instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he reverses the order. Here it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. But Moses preached in Deuteronomy chapter 5, you will not covet your neighbor's wife. That was the first thing he said. And then he said, you will not covet your neighbor's house. You see, from the moment David saw Bathsheba, he began to covet her. What drove his covetousness? It was the time when kings go to war. 
And David had prepared his army to go out to war again, and they had gone out for war. And David was planning to go with his army, but his commander said to him, David, you're past the age of going to war. A kind way of saying you're too old, fella. The reflexes have slowed. The peripheral vision isn't what it used to be. That arthritis in the elbow won't let you swing that sword quite like you once did. The hair is turning just a little frosty on top. You're a lot slower than you used to be. You can't jump as high as you used to. David, stay home. And he did. You could almost say that as David is looking out off of his rooftop and he sees this young, beautiful woman bathing on the rooftop nearby, this man who is going through an imposed midlife crisis. May have been desiring youth to replace his getting older. He may have been looking at this situation from the standpoint of, oh, if I were just young again. And that, oh, if I were just young again, turned into, oh, if I just had someone young to be with me. I could feel young again. And so we know the story of what David does. He sees the beauty of this youth and he brings her into his home for a meal and the eventual result is she becomes pregnant. So now the desire of his heart has to change. The desire of his heart suddenly becomes to cover up his sin. So he calls Uriah in from the battlefield for a report. Every king needs to know what's going on, so I'll just ask him to send Uriah with the report. He's one of the primary leaders of the army, and he can report to me what's going on. So Uriah comes home and gives his report, and David feeds him a meal and gives him drink and says to him, Go home to your wife, you deserve it. And Uriah says, My Lord, why should I go home to my wife when all the rest of the army is out there on the field, sleeping in their tents and on the ground? Why should I go home and enjoy the comforts of family and life when indeed the army is there? I should be with them. I'm just going to sleep on the porch here at the castle, the palace. Word comes to David, Uriah slept on the steps last night. Tell Uriah to come for dinner tonight. Uriah comes in. He feeds him again. He gets him drunk. And he says to him, go home to your wife. And Uriah says, my Lord, why can't I? I can't go. The army's in the field. They're at battle. And David probably is sitting there going, don't rub it in, son. I can't go. And Uriah doesn't go home. David intentionally tried to have Uriah go home to his wife to cover up the adulterous pregnancy. And he doesn't. David wants to cover up his sin. And so when he sends Uriah back to the soldiers, he has a written note to the commander. And in that written note that Uriah takes back, it is written that Uriah is to be sent leading a group into battle, and when the battle is fiercest, they are to pull back everyone but Uriah. And the obvious result is Uriah dies because he is killed. And when word is sent to David to tell him that Uriah is dead,
the commander says to the messenger, Tell the king Uriah is dead, but let him know in words that were given in such a way that David would know it was his fault if it happened. Uriah dies and Bathsheba goes through the time of mourning and then David brings her into his home and makes her his wife. And Scripture says, but the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. It all began with covetousness that filled his heart in that moment on a rooftop that developed into trying to cover up his sin so that David not only commits adultery, but he lies, commits murder, steals the wife of Uriah because his heart's desire was for that youthful young lady to be his. What's on your rooftop? What do you see that develops your heart's desire so that you're willing to do whatever is necessary to have that desire fulfilled? And then when that desire is fulfilled, it causes you then to have to take other steps that are necessary, that are not fitting and proper, but are sin to try to cover it up. You see, what his heart desire, what his heart desired, led him to do something that caused him to be a different kind of man than he was. For what does the Scripture say of David? It says that he was a man after God's own heart. But for a short time in his life, he didn't pursue the things of God. Do you have a desire in your heart that if you were to achieve it, would cause you no longer to be able to pursue the things of God? I've seen those who have desired work, a job, and when they got that job, there were so many demands placed upon them that they, I'm sorry, Pastor, I just am not going to be able to do as much in church as I was doing because I suddenly got this job that is the one that I've been wanting and longing for, and I finally got it, and so therefore I'm going to pour myself into it. And in doing so, they found themselves not following after godliness and righteousness and holiness, but pursuing the reward of their labor, not the things of God. Another question that we could ask is, what's in your tent? Achan, we've talked about, as we've mentioned him in some sermons before, but at Jericho, Israel began their conquest of the promised land. Jericho was a city that was under the ban. It was to belong to God. And everything in it was to belong to God. But we know the story. Achan sins against God by stealing from God. When he's confronted by Joshua, he confesses, In Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle or tapestry from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them. He literally admits he coveted them. I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent and the silver underneath it. We know the result of that. Not only did Achan pay the price for what he did, but his whole family paid the price for what he did. What he coveted, what he brought home, what he put into his house, led to the demise of all that he had, the ruining of his reputation, and the destruction of his family. What do you desire? 
What are you willing to do to get what you desire? What motivates you in the steps that you take? Because when it was evident that Israel had sin in the camp, Achan didn't just step forward and say, It is me, I am sorry. Achan thought he could continue to conceal what he had done because he had hidden it in the soil under his tent. He buried it under the house. Back in the 70s, I became the editor of a daily newspaper in Weatherford, Texas. A few days after I became editor of the paper, there was a little story that came across the AP wire, and I took that little story and I put it on the front page, and we blocked it in and did it in bold, and my publisher became very angry with me about that because he said, you know, he said, we don't do that kind of thing on our paper. I said, you're going to this time. And he said, let me ask you a question. Are you willing to stake your job on that little three-inch box. I said, I'm willing to stake my job on that three-inch box. I said, do you believe in gut feelings? And in newspaper work, you do a lot of things off gut feeling. That night, on ABC, CBS, and NBC News, back in the 70s, those were the big news channels. That night, each network gave five minutes to that story. The next morning when I walked into work, the phones were ringing off the wall. I didn't know what was going on and come to find out those were subscriptions. People were calling in to subscribe because we had scooped the Star Telegram out of Fort Worth, which was the major newspaper for that area, with that story. And we kept running that story. In the next three weeks, our circulation doubled and our street sales tripled because of that one story. It seems that this man, under his house, they had found the bodies of three teenage boys. And in questioning the man and in following his habits, they went along the beach and they found bodies buried at the beach. When it was over, there were over 20 bodies found that this man had buried. Why? Because of his heart's desire, which was vile and and despicable. But he thought he could hide it and get away. Your heart's desire may not be that despicable. But my question is, to what extent would you be willing to go to hide a heart's desire that is evil? What's in your property portfolio? King Ahab, Israel's king, looked out from his second palace in Jezreel. His first palace was back in Samaria. He had a second palace in Jezreel. He was at Jezreel one day, and he looked out, and he saw not far from his palace a vineyard. The vineyard was close. It was just a short walk. Vineyard looked productive. It would be a wonderful vegetable garden. So Ahab goes to visit Naboth, who owns the vineyard. And he says to Naboth, I want to buy your vineyard. It will make a beautiful vegetable garden for me so close here to my palace. And Naboth said, I'm sorry, Your Majesty, but I inherited this land. And it's been in my family for generations since they had entered the promised land. 
He said, this is my family inheritance, and now I've been given the trust of this family inheritance, and I have no desire to sell. Well, Naboth is king. He could have gone anywhere else and found a parcel of land and purchased it, obviously, but he doesn't. He goes back into the palace of Jezreel. He goes to his bed. He lays down upon his bed. He faces the wall, and he refuses to eat. Sullen and angry that this man will not sell him that piece of ground which he covets. It is his heart's desire. Well, Jezebel, his wife, finds out what kind of fit Ahab is throwing. And she goes into the bedroom and she handles this in the perfect wifely manner. She looks at him and she says, you're the king. Get up. Eat. We're going to get that garden no matter what. And so she writes letters to the men of the city and says to the men of the city, men of authority, plan a dinner. Honor Naboth. But sit on either side of him two scoundrels, two scurrilous men, whom you will have to testify against Naboth, to say that he has spoken against the king, to say that he has done deeds that were inappropriate. And the men of the city do exactly as they're asked. They plan a dinner. Naboth is invited. He's seated before everyone, two scurrilous men on either side. And they say of Naboth, that he is a man who has cursed God and the king. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 21, you find this story. And the exact content of the letter that Jezebel wrote. Now proclaim a fast, seat Naboth at the head of the people, seat two worthless men before him, and let them testify was a false witness against him, saying, You curse God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death to get a heart's desire. A lie was told, and a murder occurred. Naboth got his vineyard to turn into a vegetable garden. But Elijah the prophet comes to talk. And Elijah the prophet says to Naboth, the dogs that licked up, uh, says to Ahab, the dogs that licked up the blood of Naboth will lick up your blood as well. Heart's desire that led to death. Micah the prophet says in Micah chapter 2, verse 2, a hundred years later, that this may have happened in Israel, but here's what was happening in Judah when Micah spoke. He said, Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When the morning comes, they do it, for it is the power of their hands. They covet fields and then seize them in houses and take them away. They rob a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. You see, Ahab wasn't an isolated incident of covet and do to take a man's property. It happened, well, it's happening today, isn't it? Where people are scheming and plotting how they can get what is yours so that it will be theirs. Robbing people of their homes and their inheritance. It's a universal problem. The first woman, Eve, 
coveted the forbidden fruit of Eden's tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. We hear the story of her coveting. And it wasn't that she coveted the fruit. She coveted what the fruit would produce. You see, when you look at coveting, you have to get down to the very heart of the matter. It wasn't just David taking Bathsheba. It was David seeing his own weaknesses and inadequacies that caused him to covet, to lust for, to desire something he really couldn't have. It wasn't Naboth wanting a garden. It wasn't Naboth wanting a piece of ground. It was Naboth wanting something he couldn't have, even though he had power, position, and prestige. He couldn't have that piece of ground. It wasn't Achan seeing that wonderful, beautiful mantle and the wealth that would come from the other so much as it was Achan seeing something that was unapproachable that he couldn't have. When Eve in the Garden of Eden sees the forbidden fruit, the Scripture tells us that Satan said to her, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. Eve takes the fruit. And in her coveting of that fruit, she sees that it was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that it would fulfill her desires, the pride of life. She saw that the tree was desirable to make one wise. You see, what Eve wanted was not a bite of that fruit. What Eve wanted was the wisdom that that fruit supposedly would bring to her, that she would be as wise as God. Isn't it true that in our world, the great desire that men face is the desire to be God? To be their own God. To have power and position. To rule their own destiny. To determine their own course. To be sovereign in all things of their life. And they see that it is impossible for we grow old and weaker. It is impossible because our mind begins to falter as time passes and we never have enough knowledge. Ever learning but never coming to truth. We never have enough wisdom. We need to seek counsel. We never have enough money. We have to borrow it or charge it. We never have enough. But we think we can be our own God. Eve wanted the knowledge that God had. She wanted to be like God. She ate. And when she did, she led another to eat. She handed the fruit to Adam, and he ate. You see, when we covet and then get it, it always ruins the lives of those around us as well as our own. When what we covet is against God. Ruining the lives of others. In the previous examples that we've talked about, that she was husband Uriah is dead. Here's a life wasted. Here's a military leader betrayed. Here's a husband's life cut short. Because the king, one of power and position, 
had a desire. He coveted. There was Achan's family stoned. Naboth is murdered. And Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, resulting in the fact that all mankind comes under the curse of sin. Until we come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 5, just as though, uh, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Thank you, Adam, very much. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. We thank you, God. Sin enters and Christ comes. Paul said to the Corinthian believers, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ will all be made alive. Coveting? The heart's desire for that which is opposed to the purpose of God leads to sin. And it not only affects the one, but it affects the many. What good is coveting? There were two brothers who were arguing over an inheritance. They were arguing about how much each one should have. And so they come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, One of the brothers, Master, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He's not being very liberal in sharing his inheritance with me. And Jesus said, Beware and be on guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Why are you coveting that piece of that inheritance when it's not possessions that make any difference in your life? Do you remember the time when the man ran up to Jesus and knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22 tells us the story. Jesus turned to this rich young ruler and said to him, Honor your parents. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. And the young man responded by saying, I've kept all these from my youth up. And then Jesus talks about his heart's desire. Jesus says to him, One thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. With sadness, with grief, the young man walks away, for he was one who owned much property. Here's a man whose desire was salvation, but his heart's desire was to keep what he had. His heart's desire was his wealth. His heart's desire was his possessions. His heart's desire was his privilege. His heart's desire was his property. You know what's interesting? When the young man walked away because he had so much possessions, Jesus' disciples said to Jesus, If he can't be saved, who can? You see, the idea was that if you had riches... It was God's favor to you. It was God's way of blessing you if you had much. And so if God's blessing you, obviously God is approving you and God is going to bring you into His presence. And Jesus says to His disciples that that which is impossible for man, all things are possible with God. See, God doesn't look at what we've got. God looks at who we are. What's your heart's desire? What's that one thing? 
What's that one person? What's that one place that you desire? What's that position? What's that prominence? What's that power that you desire? Jesus reminds us that all of these things that are of the world will pass away. Jesus said that entrance to the kingdom of heaven is not available to a person who holds wealth, position, privilege, but it is the gift of God to man. What's the desire of your heart? What are you willing to do to attain that desire? Let me say to you, let's be careful what we desire. Because one can gain the whole world and lose their soul. What do you want more than anything? Have you wanted something and got it? And realized when you got it, it wasn't enough. It just wasn't enough. Want that new car? Got that new car. Man, there's a car that's got more get up and go than mine. Has more luxury than mine. Has more whatever than mine. You ever wanted that property? And you got that property? And suddenly you found out that there were some flaws in that property? It wasn't as productive as it was promised? You were going to have to add ammonia constantly to keep the grass green? Have you ever gotten wealth and found out it wasn't enough? See, this is the problem. What we have in this world can never be enough to satisfy a desiring heart. So what should we desire? Paul said in his letter to the Corinthian believers that we should desire the great gifts. We should desire to be able to proclaim the gospel. We should be desire to give mercy, to show mercy. We should desire those good gifts that transform lives and enable us to serve others. You see, if it's a selfish desire, it can be destructive to us and destructive to others. I mentioned Wednesday night the destruction that came upon David David should have been stoned for the adultery that he committed, but it was not. God did not allow that to happen, but David paid a price. He paid a price in that the baby born to him, Bathsheba, died. He paid a price in that Amnon and Absalom were both killed. And he paid a price that may have been the most horrendous price of all. He had a beautiful daughter named Tamar. Everyone admired her beauty, and one of her brothers, this is a brother, David, David had more than one wife, obviously, because he was king, so Tamar and this brother were from different moms. And this brother lusted for Tamar. He wanted her. He loved her with a great love, it is said. So he talked to one of his buddies and he said, how am I going to handle this? I, I, I need to find a way to tell her. I need, a, I need to find a way for, for this to take place. And he, he knew it really couldn't take place because of the family ties that they had that would be incest in order for him to marry her. He knew he really couldn't do that kind of thing according to the law that they had at that time. But he said to his buddy, I don't I, I, and there's got to be some way I can tell her how I feel and consummate how I feel. This buddy said there is. Pretend you're sick. Pretend you're sick, and when the king says, what can we do to help you? Say to him, send Tamar to fix a meal for me and have her feed me, hand feed me herself.
So he does. He tends to be sick. King comes in, checks on him. What can I do? Send Tamar to prepare a meal for me and to hand feed me. King orders Tamar to go in and prepare her brother a meal. She goes in. She prepares the meal in his presence, just as commanded. And when she hands him the meal, he says, I'm too weak. I can't do it myself. I need you to feed me by your own hand. And she does. And in that intimate moment of sister caring for brother, he took her and forced himself upon her. And you know what the Scripture says? The Scripture says that with the love with which he had loved Tamar, he hated her to the same level. He hated her after he had taken her, after he had raped her. He hated her, his own sister. He got what his heart desired. He got what he had coveted. He got what he had lied for. He got what he stole from Tamar. He did all of this with the help of a friend. How many lives were ruined? His, the friend, and Tamar, When the truth was told to the king of what had happened, she was taken and she was taken to the king's home and never again went out. Never again to have a relationship with others except those who served her. Can a heart's desire be crippling? Can a heart's desire be deadly? Can a heart's desire be dangerous? Care for what your heart desires. Let it be the good gifts of God and not the things of this world. Why do I preach this message this morning? Well, first of all, there may be someone listening or watching who needs to hear this word, and there may even be someone in this room who needs to hear this word. But I preach this message this morning to Help us all warn our families. To warn our friends. To warn our neighbors. Be careful what you covet. What you want. What you desire. Will it build up life? Will it build up your spiritual life? And will it build the lives of others? Or is it just selfish and destructive? Father, we desire you with all our heart, and we know that you are not destructive. We know that you are not selfish. We know that you are a God of grace and mercy. Father, how we seek you with all our heart, how we pursue you with all our being. Cause us this day, Father to ask, what does my heart desire? Where will my heart's desire lead me? And who will I be when I achieve my heart's desire? Oh, Father, may our heart's desire be our relationship with you and its growth and its ministry to others. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.